let's jump into week three of the series. And, you know, this is part three of a series called What's the Point? You know, and, and we're looking at a story of a man named Saul in the Bible who was the first king of the nation of Israel, in which God's people in the Old Testament were praying for a king. They were judged by prophets and know that and God would, would, he was the king of them. And, but they kept crying out to God that they wanted a king like everybody else. So God had blessed them with a man named Saul to be king. But before Saul was ever king, God sent Saul on a special mission. It was a special mission that his dad actually sent him out to go find some donkeys. These donkey mission, we call it. And today we're going to talk about what happened on that mission, and one of the most important characteristics that people struggle with in today's time, it's something that they use all the time, it's something they feel they need all the time, and that's excuses. Oh, come on now. I told God, I said, my biggest pet peeve is when people make excuses. Thank you for allowing me to preach this today, God. But when's the last time you made an excuse? Stop nudging your spouse. Okay, stop doing it. When's the last time you made an excuse? Honestly, it's a hard question because most of us and most people don't realize that we are even making an excuse. It's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's yet, in, in the hindsight of more, what we can easily see is where excuses have limited us or held us back in some way some form or some fashion. That's why it's so important for this topic to be talked about today is when the excuses that we make are are stunning our growth spiritually. Excuses that we make are physically messing our bodies up. The excuses that we make are hurting our marriages and the relationships with our children. It's excuses that we make that affect our walk with God And today I want to break that cycle what the enemy has been using against you is making excuses and justifying why you don't do what God asks you to do. So I'm going to pray for you and we're going to open up this service with prayer because I really believe that God wants to speak the words over you today and he's going to help you break break strongholds that actually have been holding you back for so long. It's strongholds that that the excuses of every time an excuse is made, there's another link in the chain that ties us up to what God really wants us to become. So let me pray. Let's pray. Close your eyes and let's go to Jesus. Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this message. We thank you for the words that's going to come out, Lord God. We thank you for the words that is going to be spoken out of your Bible, Lord God, and that you're going to touch the hearts of people. And, Lord, we just give you praise and all thanks for the strongholds that are broken today. And no more excuses, God, that we're going to receive everything you have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's let's review in 1 Samuel chapter 9. We have been discussing the story of Saul. And Saul's first mission was to go find his dad's donkeys that were lost. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. Kish had a son named Saul. A choice and handsome man. Among the sons of Israel, there was not a man more handsome than he. For his shoulders and up he was a head taller than any other people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's fathers, had wandered off and were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you and arising, go look for the donkeys. So Saul's first mission before he became king was to go find his dad's donkeys. What a great mission. Hey, go get the donkeys, bro. Okay, dad, great. Now we got to go find the donkeys. Can you imagine the attitude? Because it says that he was handsome and he was taller than everybody else, and he came from a wealthy family because Kish had a lot of wealth. And so for someone that looked like that and had that much stature, it was probably tough for Saul to go on to this mission. But in that day, sons honored their father and did what they said they would do. That's what that today's culture struggles with that because most people don't have dads like they did in the day. 
But dads were very, very, it was, a, it was an honor when your father asked you to do something to go on the mission. It was an honor for that. And Saul went on these missions. He didn't like it, but he went on it anyway. So they take off, and it's not going well. They go through four different places, him and his servant, and they can't find the donkeys anywhere. Then they came to a place called Zoph. And look what happens next. Verse 5. When they came to the land of Zoph, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, otherwise my father will stop worrying about the donkeys and become anxious about us. Now in this moment, Saul wanted to quit the mission. His ego kicks in. And thankfully that he had a teammate, a servant, with another idea. You ever been in a moment where you wanted to quit, but you had a brother or a sister on side of you who was good friends, who said, no, you can do this. You can get through this. That's what church is all about, y'all. We are cheerleaders for each other. When each one of us want to quit the mission of God, we come on side and say, no, you can do this. I got you. I'm with you. I'm not going anywhere. Come on. Let's go on to this mission that God has called us on. That's something that Saul wanted to quit. We all want to quit missions in life, don't we? We've all had the thoughts of quitting. I remember when I planted this church seven and a half years ago, there was many a time in the beginning where it didn't look like I thought it was going to look. And I remember ordering from Domino's Pizza, and Domino's guy knocked on the door and handed the pizza, and I was like really not feeling it of church planting. And I said, you know what? You know what's a good thought, Don? I might just quit ministry and go to a less stressful place and go become a pizza delivery guy. That's actually looking better than being a pastor right now. You know, because my mission was tough. Things happen, right? You ever go through work or marriage or relationships with your kids and you just feel like giving up? Like, is this worth it? What's the point, God? But thank God that Saul, that God put a brother in Saul's life that says, hey, no, Saul, we can do this. And when Saul wanted to quit, he had a teammate that was on the side of him and said, we can do this. Listen to verse 6. The servant said to him, look here, in a city there is a man of God, and the man is held in honor. Everything that he says comes true. Now, let's go there. Perhaps he can give us advice so, about our journey and tell us where we should go. Verse 7, and Saul said to his servant, but look, if we go to see him, what shall we bring to the man? For the bread from our sacks is gone, and there's no gift to bring the man of God. What do we have to offer? See, in this moment, something super interesting and super relatable to our lives happens. Saul makes an excuse. His teammate is offering a legitimate excuse option, and he makes an excuse. So I have three thoughts on excuses. Here's the first one if you're going to take notes. Let's talk about this today. Excuses always begin with but. Some of your buts been in the way of your life for a long time, and they're really big. It's time to remove your butts out the way. But. It's almost a curse word. Listen to what 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7, the beginning of that. We're going to reread this. Then Saul said to his servant, but look. It was a word from God. Hey, Saul, let's go. I know a man in the other town that could give us advice. And Saul went, but. When his buddy offers a possible full solution, the first thing out of his mouth is, 
but. Now, before we start dogging Saul, let's be honest with ourselves. We do this all the time, don't we? Come on now. When we talk about exercising and eating right, our to-do list, our housework, our paperwork, any type of work, we all make excuses. A couple of weeks ago, I've been struggling because I gained a bunch of weight from January till a couple months ago. And God has been punching me to stop and start eating right and doing right with my body because my body is a temple, the Word says. And as Christians, it's easy to go, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't do these things, but I can eat as much as I want and kill my body. Now, this is maybe not condemnation on your, this is not condemnation or even conviction on your part, it's a conviction of me. And go, so God started challenging me on my health, eating, and telling me I was living in sin. And I was in our group, our freedom group, with a bunch of brothers, and I walked out when God challenged me. I literally was challenged by God of going, you're eating wrong, and you're, you're drinking too many uh, caffeinated drinks, and all these things. And it was so real, like I literally did something crazy sinful. It was felt that bad in my life when God challenged me. I walked out of the room. I was we were right here. I walked out, and I went and cried, asking God for forgiveness. And I came back, and they had all the brothers that were at my table, and they were like, dude, you okay? I'm like, no, God convicted me so much, I had to go cry and ask God for forgiveness. And let me tell you this. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been delivered from wanting food as an out for my stress and my worry. When I say delivered, I don't even look for it anymore. I don't look for the caffeinated drinks. I don't look for anything. I look for God. It was a deliverance that God had placed in my life because I stopped making the excuses, but. One of the biggest excuses I would make when I'm going to go on a diet is I'll do it on Monday. Come on, anybody ever had that excuse? So that way all weekend I can eat like a what? Like I want. Some people say I'm loading up so I can go on a diet on Monday. Then Monday comes around, and then you're what? You're struggling to want that sugar. And then your spouse, who doesn't struggle with weight, decides to go, hey, I'm eating Oreos. Do you want some? I'm like, are you serious? Do you see this figure compared to yours? This ain't going well, Dawn. How dare you? But I would always have an excuse. I was always having an excuse. But after the trip, but after the vacation, but after this meeting, you know, I got to go on a, a lunch meeting with, with this brother and really talk with him. So he wants to eat, like, you know, Popeyes and stuff. So I don't want to go there and say I'm on a diet. You know, a little bit of pride sleeps in. I'm going to do that after the meeting. Well, you know, after those meetings and after those trips and after that, my butt starts getting bigger, not just out of my mouth, but in my behind. Anybody ever been there? Come on, raise your hand. Yeah, come on now. It's excuses after excuse. So I said, hey, God, thank you, because right before holidays, you tell me don't eat bad. So I'm like, what am I going to eat now? He said, my word. I'm like, that's, that's being really, really biblical, God. Like, seriously. But you know what? Let me say this. Stop using Monday as an excuse. Stop using the meetings as an excuse. Make it personal. Here's a great question to ask. Where have you been making an excuse? How long are you going to go to let the same excuse keep you from moving forward? I'm very transparent. And I'm, I'm telling you, God delivered me from my own self. And if we want to find any excuse for anything, we always can. We really could. We can make an excuse for anything. I hear people making excuses in their Christian walk. Jesus says, I'm, I'm the vine and you're the branch. I want all of you. Yeah, but I'll give you some of me, God, but I'm not giving up all this other stuff. Jesus called his disciples and said, you're not going to be fisher, fisher for, for fish anymore. You're going to be fishers of people, of men. 
And guess what? But you've got to give up your livelihood and who you are and what you and your identity says you are, what other people say you are, and you're going to follow me. And you know what? Following me is going to turn your mama against you. It's going to turn your own kids against you. Jesus said these things. And that's where the excuses come in. When it starts to look too hard to follow God, we make excuses why we don't go there. Well, it's going to hurt my relationship with my spouse. It's going to hurt my relationship with my mom and dad. Well, guess what? Let God handle that. And you be obedient to what he does. And you'll be surprised that your family members and your children and your children's children will come to know Christ because of your excuses of moving them out the way and taking the butts out of your equation and going, God, I'm going to follow you too, no matter what's the cost. It is so hard to do. That's why we need each other. That's why churches are so important is because we need each other to lock arms, that we think alike. We understand the struggle. We know that it's going to be hard. But Saul wanted to give up. And his excuses almost got in the way. Here's another thought on excuses. Number two, if you're taking notes, excuses come from three places. Pride, fear, and a scarcity mentality. The first one is pride. Did you catch the thought process and did it start to kick in for Saul when he wanted to quit? Did you catch it? Listen to this. First Saul, Samuel chapter 9, verse 5. The last part of this scripture says, Come, let us return. Otherwise, my father will stop worrying about the donkeys, and of course he's going to worry about me. Man, it's easy for our ego to kick in on a donkey mission, isn't it? This is beneath me. I'm not doing that. I deserve better than this. If people knew what they were asking me to do, they wouldn't be asking me that. Another excuse. I shouldn't have to do this. This is humiliating. I don't know about you, but pride keeps people from moving closer to Jesus. Jesus' calling is not easy, church. But it's the most rewarding thing you'll ever do in your life is if you remove yourself out of the equation of what God wants you to do and you start putting in what God wants you to do first, he will take that equation and turn it for your good. I need you to hear this. Giving up what God said to give up, and I know you hear this, and the enemy is going to try to speak to you differently. He told some of you that you had to give up something that you had to give up a job, that you had to give up moving to a job to stay here locally. He told somebody something that you've been fighting and making a bunch of butts by these excuses, and all he wants you to do is surrender. And when you surrender, guess what he's going to do? All the things that you worry about, all the things, which brings us to the second point, fear. Pride gets in the way, so does fear. The enemy says, if you do these things, this is what's going to happen to you. If you follow Jesus to the fullest, this might hurt your family and your kids. And I don't know, your job might get rid of you. All these things start to take place into your life, and the enemy starts to speak. And you start to make excuses why you're not fully engaged followers of Jesus. That's why I wore my shirt that says fully engaged today. Because being fully engaged means fully surrendered. It's not being fully in, it's being fully surrendered. And guys, this can happen to all of us. If you're a brand new believer, be fully in. Fully surrendered. Fully surrendered means this. God, I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. I'm going to be wherever you're at, but you're first in my life and everything else is second. Because when a servant offered this, this viable option, look what Saul says again. He says, Then Saul said to his servants, but look, if we go to see him, what shall we bring to the man? For the bread of our sacks is gone, and there is no gift to bring to the man of God. What do we have to offer? That's a big question for most of you. You know people don't serve in ministry at a church. It's because they don't feel they can offer anything. 
It's the biggest excuse in the lie of the enemy that you have no value to, you have nothing valuable to bring to the kingdom of God. And that's a lie straight from the pit of hell. You are valuable. God killed and he put his son on a cross for you. You're the most valuable thing to him. And if you believe it or not, let me tell you, God says that you are. He instantly jumped into fear mode. What can I give? Our food is gone. We don't have a gift. How are we going to go to a man of God without anything? We have nothing. Here's a question for you to ask yourself. How often do we do that in our own lives as well? I don't have anything to give. Why tithe when I'm only going to be able to give $10, $15? What is it that $15 is going to do for the kingdom of God? Well, let me tell you, God can take $15 dollars and turn it into fifteen thousand dollars come on he can turn five in a widow's might and bring oil until it runs out god is not a little god his streets are full of gold and his pearls and diamonds god is not interested in money what he's interested in is a surrendered spirit And he says, if you are fully surrendered and fully attached to the branch, guess what? Anything you ask in my son's name, I will give it to you. I'm preaching today. Can I get an amen? So how often do we do this in our lives as well? We say these things like, I don't have anything to wear. I can't go to that event. I don't have time. Come on, I hear that all the time. What will people think? We can't afford it. The house isn't clean. I'm not going to let people at my house and have a small group. We're going to run out. What is it that makes us react the way we act when it comes to the buts is because of fear. The enemy is a master at fear. Fear of rejection. Fear of failure. Saul was afraid if he showed up to the prophets meeting without anything that was customary to the stuff that everybody else said he should have, he would be rejected. He wasn't going to do that. Inside his head, you can hear him asking, what if I'm not good enough? So I'm just not going to do it. Plain and simple, Saul was afraid to fail. And if we're going to be honest, so are we as well. Amen? We think if if, if I can't succeed, ever succeed at this, how in the world will I ever be able to handle what God's asking me to do? Guys, I was a contractor, an atheist that didn't believe in anything but myself, and I barely believed in that. All I knew was construction. Went to high school. And cheated my way to the girl inside of me and kept looking at her sheets and past high school. I'm going to be transparent here. Not the smartest bookworm in the bunch. And when God ripped me from my world and placed me in his world, all I heard is, you are this. You can do this. Here's what I'm going to do for you. Every step you take, I'm going to give you. Here's the words coming out of my mouth. It's not yours, but it's of mine. You read my word, and you soak it, and you memorize it. You place it into your soul, and thousands of lives are going to be changed from that. That was in God's point of view. My point of view says, but God, what if they find out I'm stupid? But what if they find out I can't read that well or write that well, God? What if, God, what if I don't have this Bible degree as a master degree in a doctrine, God? What if they find out that I don't have those things? God says, tell them you don't, and let me handle the rest. Well, let me say this, guys. God can use me. He can use you in his kingdom. It's not quitting your job and go plant a church in another city. It's being a believer at your job and changing your your situation through his word and living it out and being surrendered. But what happens is pride and fear seeps in, and the scarcity mentality is when the servant offers this valuable option 
Saul saw through the eyes of a scarcity, not faith. Saul said to his servant, but look, if we go to see, what shall we bring the man? Essentially, Saul saying, we don't have bread or money. We don't have enough. But the servant said and saw what could be done. And Saul saw, saw what couldn't be done. When we planted this church, I had many of people said we were going to fail. That we don't know what church planning is about. That the only church we've ever been part of is the only church that you know. You're not experienced enough to plant a church. You're going to move your family to another city and not be experienced in being in ministry full time forever. And you know what? All I heard was God say, go. And we moved to the city seven and a half years ago, and we planted this church with a vision and a purpose of God. We heard people said you couldn't, and we heard God say we could. Isn't it true that we do this in our own lives so often that we start to listen to the lies of fear? We start to have this mentality that we don't have enough to bring to the table. We start to say, my boss won't give it. Me, what I asked for to be successful, so I'm just not going to be successful. You blame your boss. My husband doesn't lead the family spiritually, so we can't. Stop using your spouse, no matter what side of the, if you're the husband or the wife, no matter which role you play, both of you are accountable to your spirituality. Stop blaming your spouse for you not being fully engaged follower of Jesus. You'll be surprised my wife didn't listen to an atheist husband who said there's no God. She went to church and prayed me in and said, God, remove his butt out the way. And guess what? I came to know Jesus because I had a woman who says I could and not couldn't do this. And today I stand on this stage. It's because it was a woman with faith who believed and every day we make valuable judgments with our money, our time, our resources. And we can always have a reason why something can't be done or we don't have enough. Three reasons we make excuses, pride, fear, and this scarcity mentality. Do you see yourself in any of these Saul's excuses? If so, what do we do? Write this down. We overcome excuses with faith. It is so powerful to me that the servant chose to see through the eyes of faith rather than the excuse of scarcity. When Saul pushes back, the servant says, the servant answered Saul with this, Here, I have with me a quarter and shekel of silver. And I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. And what he had was a quarter of shekel of silver, which was roughly 50 cents. And today's value would be $6.70. And Saul almost missed his destiny for 50 cents. 50 cents. Church. Your little bit of faith is worth much more and a lot more than you think it is. 50 cents of faith was the door opener to Saul's destiny. Listen, I get it. Are the headlines overwhelming? Yes. Are the uncertainty in the economy? Sure. All things are unstable right now? Yes, it is. Do things cost more today? Then five years ago or two years ago? Absolutely yes. But guess what, church family? We are all, and we all have a choice to make. We can either see what the world is happening now through the eyes of what the enemy says, that it's not enough, or we can see it through the eyes of God and, and walk in faith and say it is enough. Some of us need a new prescription so we can see things different because the old prescription is full of excuses and it has a blur of your vision. Saul needed a friend to help him see differently. And consider me your friend today. My name is Brian Roussel, 
and I'm your friend. And God gave me this message for you today so you can change your prescription for a new one. Just call me Doc. Because I'm going to write you some prescriptions today. Now, you can't take them to a pharmacist, but you can sure change your life with them. Here's the first one. Faith instead of fear. As your first prescription. You can take this to the bank. Now, it's not going to add money to your bank. But it will do is build your faith that God's going to provide for you, though. Some of you have been living in a lot of fear with this economy financially. And guess what? Let me tell you, walk in faith. The faith will give you the way to go. Here's another one. That's one of them. Here's another one. I'm going to write a few. I know I'm going a little long, but look, you need these prescriptions. You know, how about this one? Joy. Oh, Lord Jesus. You mean I got to be happy? Nope. God is not interested in your happiness. But he wants you to be joyful. It's a season of joy. In Christmas, right? It's joy. How do you get joy? It's a fruit of the Spirit. Remember, when you connect yourself to the branch and you're the vine, guess what grows on you? Fruit. And if it's of God, the fruit of joy will be all over you. Come on, some of you, your, your spouses are saying, preach it, son. Preach it. God, that brother's messy. Yes, he probably is, so he needs some hope. We all need hope, don't we? Some of us need to speak in each other's life. And if you're married, you need to speak into your spouse's life and tell them what they really mean to you and how awesome they are and how thankful you are. I walked into my wife's office because she's over operations and they do manuals and all kinds of things. And I walked in there and I had something on my desk that was already done and all that. And, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, hey, go thank your wife for what she does. And I went in and I said, baby, thank you for what you do at this church. And she had this biggest smile on her face that she was appreciated for what is being unseen to most people, but God's seen it because he told me to go tell her. You give hope to people, encouragement. Here's the next one, kindness. Come on now. Next month, we have a title of a series that we're starting called Living Large. It's, we're going to be a blessing to our, our, our city, and we're going to do acts of kindness, not in, in, most people do them in summer, we're going to do them in November. We're going to live large. That's, a, that's the name of the title of the message series called Living Large. And we got little cards we're going to give people that say, hey, here's, a, here's something special for you. And on the backside, invite them to church. But you actually tie them three times. Not tie them, but, but tip them three times more than what you normally tip somebody. You pay for the person's meal behind you. Just an act of kindness. A kindness comes from Jesus. Some of you don't like giving gifts, but God's going to use your gift giving to change your life. Here's another one, peace. How many people need peace today? Come on now. We need lots of peace, don't we? Generosity. These prescriptions are good. These are vitamins. I'm not giving you pain medication. I'm not giving you something that's going to block the fear and block the pride and block the I don't have enough. What these are going to do is going to fulfill the purposes of your life. They're going to fulfill everything so you don't need those things, but that you can use these things. It's a supplement that's going to help what you've been lacking, gentleness and generosity. How about this one? Here's, here's another one, love. How about loving yourself first? Here's the last one. I saved the best one. No, there's two more. I saved one of the two best for last. Patience. Come on, who prays for patience? Boy, God help you in Jesus' name. They say don't pray for patience, but you better because it's a fruit. Patience will keep you humble. Patience will keep you mild and meek. Patience will just let you stand in the ground of faith and not fear. Patience will you relying on God and waiting for him. Patience is a key, key factor to things in life. And here's the last one. Here's what I've been working out in my own life, and I want this fruit all over my life is self-control. So every time I want to eat that brownie, look, we were, we were frying catfish in the back, and I'm like, Jesus, why would you do this to me? 
for the recovery group, right? And I'm helping them. And I'm like, and the guy was cooking and said, here, try some. I'm like, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I want your nasty catfish. Oh, bro, this is the best catfish in there. My daddy taught me the lesson. I'm like, well, I'm glad your daddy taught you how to cook catfish. But it ain't coming in my belly, bro. You know, I wasn't that rude to him. I felt like it, but I didn't. No, I, I said, hey, no, man. You know what? I'm being obedient. I can't. I won't. Because I got to change myself and my life. See, start writing scripts in your life. Because it's time to start seeing your circumstances through the eyes of faith and not fear. It starts seeing the, the circumstances through Jesus' lens and not your own. Last time I checked, God still owns them all, doesn't he? Psalms chapter 50, verse 10. For all the animals in the forest are mine, he says. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird on the mountain, and all the animals of the field are mine. And if we are hungry, or if I were hungry, God says, I would not even tell you, for the world is mine and everything in it. Saul almost missed his destiny because of excuses. That doesn't have to be our story either. Today, God wanted me to tell you, stop making excuses and start living in the faith and, and what he's placed inside of you. So here's a couple questions that we're ending with. What excuse have you been making? I want you to write that down. What area of your life have you been living by fear in this world of fear and not faith? I feel like there's a burden on finances in this church. I feel like some of you are living every day paycheck to paycheck, not because you don't have enough, it's because you don't know how to manage what you do have. And we want to help you. Don't let pride and fear come in. If you need help financially, we're not giving you money. But we'll give you lessons and teach you how to manage and budget and do the right things with your money. And I want to start a small group. I, I'm, I'm saying this because I have something in plan, but I'm not going to do it unless there's people out here who want it. If you want that type of group, please put it on a, on a card or put it in, in the app on your next move. Uh, type, type that in and say, I would be interested into a financial small group to, be, to help with finances, to teach me how to handle that and manage that. So I'm going to pray for you today, and I want to see God move in you today, and I want, to, I want you to know this, that, that the number one command Jesus said is don't worry. 300, I meant 131 times, Jesus says, do not worry. And I think he's trying to get us to see something, because Saul, again, almost missed his destiny because of his excuses, and that doesn't have to be our story either. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for what you're doing in the hearts of the people. I thank you for everything that you have placed inside of the hearts of everyone, the destiny that you have placed, the, the move of God inside of their hearts, the excuses. Lord, every excuse that was out there, every excuse that the enemy has placed, Lord, we ask that you just remove it. Holy Spirit, that you're speaking to people right now. And they just know. You have been challenging them for years to give something up. You have been pushing them to stop using that credit card. You have saved them many of times and removed the debt from their life, and they keep getting back in it. Many a times you told them to stay in their marriage, but they're still making the butts why they need to leave. Lord, we ask that you remove the pride and remove the fear and fill it with your spirit and your fruit. We thank you for this. 
We give you praise for all the things you're doing in people's hearts today. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said with one big amen, amen. Come on, let's give Jesus praise today. Hey, let me say this. Thank you. Thank you for giving up your butts today and filling it with the faith. Don't forget, here's a few things happening here at Connect Fellowship Church. Recovery group. Driftwood. We have multiple things coming up in the next couple months that we'll, we'll let you know about. But guys, I just want to say thank you for being part of Connect Fellowship Church. Thank you for giving, believing in the vision. But you have something to bring to the table. You do. And I hope you receive that today. Come on, let's stand. Let's stand. Don't forget if you want a book, let us know or purchase it on the app. Just through giving and then type in Donkey Mission book, five bucks. It's a great read. It'll help you understand what we're preaching in depth. So it's really good, great, great concept if you want to buy the book. Well, let me pray for you as we leave today. God's moving. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I just thank you. I thank you for what you've done in the hearts of the people. I thank you for every person who's given their tithe and their offering to the storehouse. I thank you for the people who are just plugged in, who are seeing what you have for them. God, that they're going to be husbands and wives. Lord, they're going to be better friends and coworkers. Father God, we thank you for what you're going to do in their life through Connect Fellowship Church. Use us, God, to change a world, Lord, in our city and our own homes. We give you praise for that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Love you guys. I'll see you next week. Y'all have a good day. Thank you so much for joining us online. Connect Fellowship Church exists to see people change their family tree. We would love to hear about what God is doing in your life. You could tell us by going to connectfellowship.church forward slash connection card. You can also connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. For locations and service times, visit us at connectfellowship.church. Also, if you would like to be a part of what God is doing here at Connect Fellowship Church by giving, go to connectfellowship.church, or you can download the app and give that way as well. We are so excited that you were able to join us today, and our goal is that you have experienced a life change through this message. We hope that you have an amazing day.